Antarctic Lake is full of life. Antarctica is known for being a place where life does not flourish. Although creatures such as penguins, seals and krill do inhabit the barren land, most of these species do not live there year-round and migrate elsewhere to escape the totally inhospitable and brutal winter. When researchers visit, the conditions are so extreme that they must take intense precautions to prevent hypothermia, or worse. The last thing that any of these researchers expected to find was an area actually teeming with life, but that is exactly what they stumbled upon. Under an ice sheet about 3,500 feet thick lies a lake about 50 feet deep and 54 miles square. Researchers interested in studying this lake used drills and hot water to break through the layer of ice and take 15 gallons of water samples and a sediment core over 15 feet long from the dark water below. What these samples revealed surprised the researchers. Study and analysis determined that the subglacial lake was positively teeming with bacterial life and the samples taken contained an average of 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Although this number may seem paltry in comparison to the 1 million bacterial cells per milliliter in samples taken from the ocean for a totally sunless underground lake, the numbers are astonishing. The fact that there is such a relative abundance of organic matter means that the lake could very likely be supporting other, more complex life forms, which the research expedition will begin to search for soon. A nearby subglacial lake also revealed abnormally high levels of bacteria during an expedition in 2013, which further validates these more recent findings and leads researchers to theorize that the lakes were at one point connected to the larger ocean thousands of years ago and thus have remnants of carbon deposits from early photosynthesizing organisms that allow the modern-day bacteria to survive. The discovery of such a surprising abundance of life forms is important to researchers for two reasons. The first is that it gives hope and guidance to the search for extraterrestrial life forms, especially on Mars, which has evidence of dried up underground saltwater lakes not unlike the one uncovered in the Antarctic. The second benefit of this discovery for researchers is that it provides important information about the history of Antarctica and what that now uninhabited place might have looked like thousands of years ago. Scientists who are studying these underground lakes believe that there could be over 400 such examples scattered throughout Antarctica, and rather than a gigantic ice sheet covering the Earth's surface, the barren land is actually more like a frozen wetland with rivers and lakes as big as some of the Amazonian bodies of water. Further analysis of these subglacial lakes will continue to shed more light on what might actually be a more complex ecosystem than anyone has yet realized. The Money Pit and the Inscribed Stone in 1795, an exciting discovery was made upon Oak Island by 16-year-old Daniel McGuinness. McGuinness had been adventuring over to Oak Island for a fishing trip when he stumbled across a tree with markings upon it, which evidently were not natural. Beneath the tree, a depression could be seen, with some neighboring trees having been removed. Some retellings say it was this that indicated, at least to Daniel McGuinness, that something may be buried beneath though others point to a block and tackle hanging from the limb of a tree being the factor that encouraged further exploration of the unusual site. McGuinness, with the aid of two friends, got to digging. Despite the speculation as to other reasons, presumably the motivating factor to investigate the site is the piracy history of Oak Island. Between 1690 and 1730, Oak Island was described as being in the golden age of piracy, according to the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. With Nova Scotia having very few European settlements within the 18th century, it was common knowledge that pirates would frequent the seas and land surrounding Oak Island, and so presumably Oak Island itself. With Oak Island being relatively uninhabited, it was the perfect place for these pirates to leave their treasures, with a famous confirmed example being Captain William Kidd, who admittedly buried his wealth in 1699. As the boys dug, they began to uncover a layer of flagstone. Though despite initial excitement, beneath it was only more dirt. 
Further investigation led the boys to find rotten wooden timbers that had been driven into the tunnel wall at approximately 10 feet deep. The same discovery was made again at 20 feet. These barriers continued to appear at regular intervals, blocking the teenage team from success. Eventually, the team decided to halt their excavation, having found very little, and return in two weeks' time when their mission met a similar end. Years later, in 1804, a significantly larger group returned to conduct a formal excavation, eventually revealing a pit, which many theorized was created to conceal jewels or other items of monetary value. Once the team hit 90 feet deep into the money pit, a granite stone was discovered. This stone had some rather peculiar inscription symbols that even to this day have never been successfully translated. Whilst this stone is yet to be cracked, Many guesses and partial suggestions have been made, with the leading theory being that this stone's mysterious message translates to 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried, a translation presented by Leitchi, a professor of languages at Dalhousie University. This message might simply be some hopeful souls feeling optimistic as to Oak Island's legends of treasure existing or may give us another clue and place us one step closer to the fortune we suspect is hidden. The key to the code is believed to be found within Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, as this code appears to form the coherent sentence above. Prior to translating this sentence, the stone was allegedly used as a doorstop or as a display item in the window of a bookbinder's shop to encourage people visiting. While we are yet to stumble across the £2 million fortune, it is an exciting mission and a well-kept secret of Oak Island. US Reveal Battlefield-Ready Robots Robotics in the battlefield has been talked about extensively over the last decade or two. With advancements in robotics being seen in multiple fields, it is no wonder that we are getting closer to the reality of robots on the battlefield. The US has revealed battlefield-ready robots, although it is worth noting that these are not autonomous humanoid robots, but more along the lines of unmanned vehicles. The Packbot was one of the first robots to enter the battlefield in 2002, which is controlled by what looks like a gamepad and is designed for use by troops and first responders to carry out dangerous missions in high-threat battlefield scenarios. It has since been improved multiple times over. The latest iteration, the 510 Packbot, is a multi-mission tactical mobile robot developed by Endeavour Robotics, which is now part of FLIR Systems. Developed by the same company and ordered by the US military in 2017 is the FLIR Centaur, a man-transportable robotic system increment to solution. According to FLIR, this remotely operated medium-sized system provides a standoff capability to detect confirm, identify, and dispose of hazards. The Fully Interoperability Profile, or IOP, compliant, open-architected robot has a standard chassis and modular mission payloads in support of current and future missions. Centaur supports engineers, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, and explosive ordnance disposable soldiers. This system was originally meant to be fielded by 2021, but the first unit was equipped the MRES Inc. 2 in the second quarter of the Army's fiscal 2020. In a press release by the US Army, Brian McVeigh, the Army's project manager for force protection, stated, During recent conflicts, the Army purchased more than 7,000 unique robotic systems. The MTRS 2 is the first in a series of programs to replace these with a more flexible system. The press release also mentioned the payloads that will be integrated into MTRS Inc. 2 will allow for better remote threat detection, even in low-light environments, and improved remote interrogation of improvised explosive devices, allowing soldiers to determine the nature of such threats from a safe distance. Battlefield-ready robots will be advancing at a rapid pace, with the introduction of artificial intelligence, so these robots can make decisions and potentially the development of humanoid robots that can be used as soldiers. While it is unlikely that militaries will allow artificial intelligence to have the final decision in a battlefield scenario, those capabilities will be a possibility. 
battlefield robots will evolve from unmanned vehicles to something similar to those seen on TV. It is unlikely that robots will replace human soldiers on the battlefield. They will be used in more supportive positions to enhance the capabilities of humans in battle. Where have South Africa's Great Whites gone? False Bay and Gowns Bay are two bodies of water off the coast of South Africa that are hotspots for Great White Shark activity. However, in recent years, the sightings have all but vanished. Scientists quickly grew concerned at the sudden disappearance of the water's regular inhabitants, and research quickly began to determine the source. According to the publication Monga Bay, White sharks were a very common sight in False Bay, just one of the two bodies of water of interest. From a write-up, Shark Spotters reports that between the years 2010 and 2016, there were an average of 205 sightings a year, but in 2018, that number reduced to just 50 sightings. Not one sighting occurred in 2019. Thankfully, one sighting did occur in January 2020, the first in 20 months of zero activity. The reality is that we have way more theories than we have facts to support them at the moment, says Alison Cock, a marine biologist for South African National Parks who has been researching white sharks in Africa since 1998. Great white numbers are uncertain in South Africa. Some estimates have put the population total at 500, while others suggest 900. Regardless, the number is hardly indicative of a thriving species. Sara Andreotti of Stellenbosch University studies the genetics of white sharks around the South African coast. Andreotti's research has uncovered that sharks around the coast are actually just one group, which moves from location to location, breeding with one another. In her study conducted from 2009 to 2011, Andreotti believed to have identified 300 breeders in the population. The minimum to avoid inbreeding is 500, and according to Andreotti, our population was in real trouble already. So why did the Great Whites suddenly disappear from the South African coastline? Well, the answer might lie in the shark's pop culture cousin, the orca whale. Orcas are also present in the bodies of water that Great Whites normally thrive in. Scientists have identified two particular orca whales, named Port and Starboard, which were first spotted in False Bay in 2015. Orcas have slowly increased their activity in the area since 2009, and at this time the number of deceased broadnose seven-gill sharks began to show up in the waters off the South African coast. Alarmingly, these were the first records of orcas hunting sharks in South Africa. A paper was published on the first documentation of a novel feeding technique. Succinctly, the orcas had been using brute force to damage the shark's pectoral girdles. This allowed the orcas to bite out the shark's livers before leaving the rest of the carcass. Orcas do this because livers are incredibly high in fat, and shark livers equal roughly a third of each shark's body weight. After the first attacks, the seven gill sharks soon dispersed from the area. Despite being one of the world's biggest hotspots in activity for seven gills, the sharks were gone for a month. This pattern seems to match up to the Great White events post-2017. As the Great White sightings began to lower, a total of five Great Whites were found washed up on the coast of Garnsby, each of them missing their livers. The evidence of large teeth marks clearly pointed to the local orcas. While Port and Starboard were the only present orcas in the bay, Researchers have given word of another orca in the area, resulting in continued drops in sightings. This behavior might point towards a different ecotype of orca, one that is primarily a shark eater. Reasons for this behavioral adaptation could stem from water temperature change due to climate change, as well as overfishing. Where is Alexander the Great's tomb? Alexander the Great is the Macedonian king famous for his monumental empire that is still studied to this day as an example of military strategy and power. Inheriting the throne at the young age of 20, he proved to be one of the greatest military masterminds that the world had ever seen, and, with the support of his fiercely loyal soldiers, 
began expanding his reign into the largest empire of the time, spanning three countries and leaving dozens of cities founded in his name as a testament to his conquests. Alexander's life and reign have been meticulously studied, but one thing that remains a mystery is where the once great and powerful ruler was laid to rest. After only twelve years of often brutal but unparalleled rule, Alexander the Great's reign came to an end when he passed away at age 32 from a mysterious but fatal illness. Although the emperor was such an important figurehead of the day, the circumstances of his passing are rather mysterious, and nobody is certain whether he was poisoned or passed away due to a natural illness or complications of a battle wound. Regardless, Alexander's final resting place continues to elude historians and archaeologists, although there are a few facts that can provide clues in the hunt for the deceased ruler. Firstly, it is known with absolute certainty that he passed away in Babylon and was mummified to be returned to Macedonia. However, the procession was hijacked and one of his successors, King Ptolemy of Egypt, took the body to the Egyptian city of Memphis, where the body remained until it was moved to one of his many newly completed namesake cities, Alexandria, the new capital of Egypt. Alexander was given an elaborate and stately burial, with a tomb covered in a layer of glass that allowed visitors to look upon the corpse of the once powerful ruler. The Roman Emperor Augustus recorded viewing the body during his visit in 30 BCE, but that was the last instance that historians were able to determine for sure where the body laid. Because of this, many believe that he is without a doubt buried somewhere in Alexandria although the hunt is greatly hampered by the fact that most of what was then the important and royal areas of the city are now underwater, making it nearly impossible to search the ancient ruins. However, there are other commonly proposed theories as to the final resting place of Alexander the Great. Some speculate that he was buried in the Nabi Daniel Mosque in Alexandria, which has a deep enough basement that it would have been a viable place for a respected ruler's burial during the time period. Others believe that Alexander is now buried under St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, Italy, having been exhumed by Reddick searchers who mistook his grave for the gospel writer Mark. Many propose that he is actually buried on the oasis of Siwa, which is a beautiful place that was said to be home to the oracle Ammon, and was thought to be considered sacred by Alexander and the place that he truly wished to be buried. After having his body on display for his many followers and former subjects to pay their last respects to the powerful man, some think that he was exhumed and reburied on Siwa, per his supposed final wishes. One thing is for sure, that nobody is certain where Alexander the Great was laid to rest, and the search continues. <laughs>